Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, or good morning for me um, and most of you. It's uh, good afternoon for you, David, who um, is in Abuja, Nigeria. Um, I have very fond memories of Abuja. It was my <laughs> Nigeria is my second posting. Um, my name is Adam Blackwell. I'm the Vice President, International Development Services Group. And on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, GTAC, I will be moderating the session. For those who don't know us, GTAC was created by DSG and our partner at GMU's Terrorism Transnational Crime and Corruption Center, led by Dr. Louis Shelley, to support our contract with the Department of State to develop a database of global terrorism incidents, to prepare the annex of statistical information on terrorism, and to help prepare and edit the congressionally mandated country reports on terrorism. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism. If any of you listening would like to present in the future, uh, in a future opportunity, please let me know either through the uh, chat function or uh, you can send me an email. I should repeat here that the views here are those of the speaker. Uh, David is going to speak to us today about the approaching, approaching counterterrorism in the sub-Saharan Africa in the COVID-19 era, the case of ISIS in Central and West Africa. As we were just chit-chatting a little earlier, I was in Last time I was in the Sahel was in 2004, and we were talking about uh, terrorism there being the canary in the coal mine. Well, the canary is uh, well out of the coal mine, that's for sure. Um, David is an international counterterrorism and organized crime specialist. He is an active consultant, trainer, and capacity building specialist for NATO, UN, uh, USAA AFRICOM, uh, of the Department of, National Def or Department of Defense and other corporate bodies on trend analysis on terrorism networks in Africa. Mr. Otto is a pioneering expert for the Interpol Global Counterterrorism Strategy set up at the group of uh, five globally accredited subject matter experts. He also contributes towards the shaping of counterterrorism strategy in the Lake Chad, Great Lakes, Sahel and the Horn of Africa regions. He was the lead consultant for counterterrorism program design for Global Risk International with the UK. He has researched terror networks in Africa for the past 15 years and has developed a huge network in the continent. He is one of the few counterterrorism researchers and trainers for the Anti Terrorism Accreditation Board, better known as ATAB. Uh, David is also a certified master anti terrorism specialist, a certified anti terrorism specialist, and a certified financial crime examiner with ATAB. He holds a Master of Science in Counterterrorism and Organized Crime and a Certified Field Criminalistics uh, from Mexico. Uh, sorry, the first one's from the UK. And has a BA Honors in Law and Criminology, uh, also from the UK. Uh, he's a visiting professor of the East China University of Political Science and Law at the Institute of Strategic Studies. Um, ideally, David will speak to us for about 20 minutes. Uh, all of you should be aware of the Q&A uh, question and answer uh, button down on the bottom right hand corner of Zoom. As David is speaking, please um, start to uh, think of your questions and put your questions in the Q&A function because as we have said in the past, the more dynamic these sessions are, I think the more useful they are. So David, I will mute myself and over to you. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, um, um, Adam. Uh, thank you, uh, GTEC, for uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, again, because we have a mixed audience, um, you know, the uh, subject of the day talking about the approach uh, to counterterrorism in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in the COVID-19 era, um, of course, the case for ISIS in Central and West Africa. I think um, uh, I would be very brief in my uh, um, introduction and uh, allow the uh, audience to prepare for uh, questions. Uh, that way, um, I am not just talking to a, you know, a limited amount of uh, participants. You know, I, I will take any questions uh, inside or outside of this topic, um, as far as that is related to counterterrorism, uh, not just in Africa, but uh, globally. Um, I, I think the beginning of this uh, subject uh, is, is very straightforward. Uh, what is the approach uh, for uh, counterterrorism in South Southern Africa? Um, I, would, I would straightforward uh, be uh, saying that uh, th there is a predominant uh, military approach. Um, of course, um, that is, uh, uh, you know, a defect of um, the, uh, the, the, the inadequate use of, of, of an intelligence-led strategy. Um, the, 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 the lack of policing 
uh, before counterterrorism is one of the uh, weakest link uh, that we've seen, uh, not just before now during the COVID-19 era, but um, you know, in the almost uh, 20 years uh, since 9-11. Um, of course, there is also uh, a huge uh, distrust uh, in the counterterrorism approach between the uh, local communities that are supposed to be the eyes and ears of, of governments and security services. Um, you know, the, um, uh, and, and by then, uh, by so doing, you have that distrust being extended uh, to uh, governments uh, because uh, the military and the security services are, are seen in the same light. Um, as, as government. Um, again, uh, one of the uh, observations is a, an increase in, in human rights um, abuses uh, during uh, these counterterrorism strategies, but we've seen some improvement in, in civil military relationships, especially when it comes to um, certain countries in the West of Africa, like, like Nigeria. Um, another important aspect, which um, I'm sure it will be of interest to the audience, is where are we with, with, with prevention strategies? Um, again, uh, that is very limited. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, there is an increase in, in, in the kinetic military approach. Therefore, that has a direct impact on the prevention or proactive prevention strategies. Response is always, always late, uh, irrespective of where that is um, employed. Um, you know, so again, the response uh, strategies in most African countries because of the lack of uh, setting uh, capacity um, is always impacted. Again, uh, another area that uh, we have observed is the, uh, the, the weakness in the protection of critical infrastructures or persons um, that are a subject of attack uh, by military, uh, by um, in insurgency groups. Now, let me come to the point of how we got to where we are. Of course, everybody understands the uh, the prevalence of, uh, of, of terrorism and counterterrorism after 9-11. Um, we understand the impact um, of the Arab Spring to insecurity in the, in the uh, northern part of Africa. Um, we understand the, uh, the trends that the emergence of the Islamic State uh, has brought to Africa, which saw some kind of a competition and the relegation of Al Qaeda core in certain parts of Africa. But notwithstanding, we have still seen the maintenance of Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, um, in the northern part of Africa. We've also seen that in, especially uh, coming down towards Algeria, um, Egypt, uh, where you have ISIS um, in, the, uh, in the mountains, you've got uh, Libya, uh, Tunisia, which is also impacted by uh, both ISIS and, and Al Qaeda narratives. Now, another important aspect um, in, in terms of the, uh, the trends that we have seen uh, in the past uh, couple of years was the impact that the collapse of the Islamic State had in sub-Saharan Africa, especially um, when it comes to foreign fighter returnees. Um, you know, the challenge was primarily the absence of any data from African countries uh, on the people that had traveled to join the Islamic State. So what we had in effect was the return of foreign fighters in countries that they had left before, but because there was no data, it provides a huge challenge to know the number of um, foreign fighter returnees, although the African Union had put the numbers above 5,000. Now, um, I, I believe uh, from my, uh, you know, uh, research with uh, these uh, countries uh, that it could be more uh, than that. Um, now, what has been very interesting in, in, in the past year or two, which is 2019, is the emergence of uh, uh, the, another pandemic, uh, which is the COVID-19, and how that has had a, a serious impact on, on the way counterterrorism has been approached. Um, not just from a military perspective, but also uh, from a prevention uh, angle, from narratives that have been put forward by uh, terrorist groups in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but also from the, um, the point where most countries are now looking in solar. They, they're, they're focusing on, on trying to protect 
uh, the, the economic um, impact of COVID-19 uh, somehow, um, you know, uh, putting the, the fight, the global fight against uh, terrorism, you know, as a secondary uh, engagement. So that has had a serious uh, ramification in, in the way that collaboration has been carried out, uh, talking about the, uh, the humanitarian uh, interventions, um, you know, uh, shutting down of borders, uh, lockdown um, has also increased um, the level of radicalization online because um, in, in, in so many countries uh, in, in, in Africa, but also as well in, in Europe, uh, there has never been a time in, in the history where uh, lockdown measures have been implemented as we continuously see um, post uh, COVID-19. So, you know, the, the COVID-19 has a ripple effect, uh, not just on the economy or the health, uh, as we've seen, but, but also in the way that governments are approaching counterterrorism from a collaboration uh, internally and also externally. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that um, these impacts have been felt uh, across uh, the Sahel region and Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger Republic, uh, these areas uh, that form the, um, the Liptako Goma Triangle, uh, linking very much to Côte d'Ivoire, um, linking to Benin Republic, um, Nigeria in, in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, which of course has um, Boko Haram and, and the Islamic uh, State of West Africa province. So I think these countries have also had a similar challenge in the way that um, counterterrorism has been approached uh, before COVID-19 and during this period where we've got um, COVID-19. But significantly, um, what, what we see is a very powerful narrative uh, being driven by um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, terrorist organization exposing uh, for the, the weaknesses of um, governments in the sub-Saharan Africa to actually provide uh, some kind of a health or social protection for its citizens. Now, what is the impact of that? It's about the winning of hearts and minds uh, by these uh, terrorist organizations, uh, somehow saying if the government is weak, then we are strong, which is actually not necessarily uh, the, the case in practice. Again, uh, we're talking about the expansion of, of ISIS in, in East uh, of Africa. Uh, specifically, we see um, that happening in the northern part of, of Mozambique. I'm sure that uh, uh, the audience will be familiar with um, Cabo Delgado, um, which is the, uh, there is a district there, a small district called uh, Mosimbao de Praia, which has now, um, you know, uh, been at the center for the past four years of a local, group that is linked uh, so much uh, to the Islamic State. I mean, some of the people call it Al-Shabaab, um, others call it the Mochababos, and, uh, but the group calls itself Al-Sunnah Wal Jamaat and, and, and claims to have a very strong uh, affiliation with uh, the Islamic State, even though we know that uh, the Islamic State is much more of a shadow of itself in terms of its structure, uh, but still manages to espouse its um, uh, radical um, ideology uh, towards uh, the African province, uh, sorry, uh, towards Africa. Again, one area in the sub-Saharan Africa, which um, is very much linked to the Horn of Africa, is um, uh, Somalia, which continuously has a, um, a, uh, the threat from, from Al-Shabaab. Um, I know that uh, there is an upcoming election uh, in, in, in Somalia, which uh, is very much uh, contested on the on the basis of you know the the impact uh, that Al Shabaab would have if uh, uh, Amisom, which is the African mission in Somalia, finally leaves, and uh, we've also seen that uh, the the United States has limited its um, uh, its contribution of troops and and resources uh, to some of these uh, countries uh, to to the Horn of Africa. So we have that impact, and 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 that has been explained. Uh, uh, you know, uh, due to the fact that each government uh, now has to uh, focus on the economic um, impact that uh, COVID-19 has brought. Uh, and, and, and then that therefore had a direct impact on, on timelines in terms of handing over um, counterterrorism um, uh, approaches to uh, home countries in, in Somalia. 
Again, one key area that uh, we, we've got to look very closely, um, even though not so much linked to counterterrorism, is the uh, situation that is ongoing in, in Ethiopia. Of course, that is very much linked to the instability within the Horn of Africa. We've got uh, the, the crisis that has been um, brewing between the Ethiopian National Defense Forces uh, and the Tigray uh, Liberation um, Forces, that's the TPLF, uh, the Tigray People's Liberation Forces. Um, that has been a direct impact of COVID-19 uh, when the government decided to postpone the elections on the basis of, um, you know, uh, focusing on targeting the um, a strategy to um, uh, deal with uh, the uh, the impact of COVID-19. Now there is an ongoing war, which then has a direct impact on um, uh, terrorist organizations that are linked to Somalia. Um, some of the instability, which is very much uh, linked with Sudan, um, Eritrea. Um, and of course, uh, this is uh, directly impacting on on uh, on, on the uh, the counter uh, Al Shabaab, ISIS faction, and Al Qaeda faction uh, by uh, Ethiopian forces that were previously deployed to assist uh, the the Somalian government. All of these forces, or I mean, a majority of these forces, have been pulled back uh, by the Ethiopian National Defense Forces to focus on on the ongoing crisis in in the Tigray region. So I think it is very much important for, uh, for us to really understand how uh, the impact of COVID-19 has really, um, um, you know, uh, reduced, uh, so to speak, uh, the, the ability of African countries to uh, counter some of these jihadist um, uh, strategies. It's also reduced the level that um, governments uh, inside or outside, uh, be it humanitarian organizations or international organizations, to come in and, and really assist uh, countries as before. One last area which I think is worth mentioning here is the heartbeat of, of Africa, which is the Central African Republic, um, where you've got an existing um, uh, crisis there between the government and, and rebel forces uh, linked to the coalition for the patriotic uh, Central Africans by ex-president uh, Francois Bouzizi. I mean, the reason why I think that is very important and very much linked to counterterrorism is because uh, there are implications in, in terms of the way that Chad, which is an urban country, is responding to that. Uh, there is also the ripple effect uh, to uh, DRC Congo, which, you know, hosts one of the Islamic state of, uh, of Central Africa, um, which, you know, has a very strong connection uh, with uh, the, um, the Lord Resistance Army. From, from Uganda. Again, uh, that brings us to the link uh, between uh, the, the presence of jihadists and, and the affiliations to criminal networks, uh, not just within the Central Africa, but how that expands towards, uh, towards the East uh, and then eventually uh, the West uh, and north, Northern part of Africa. Um, so um, that would be my, uh, my very much quick um, uh, appreciation of the uh, of the current dynamics in terms of the, the strategies that have been put in place. Uh, and I'll very much um, look to answering some of your questions. Uh, over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I know it's a lot of territory to cover in a very short period of time, and um, I think you've done a, uh, an excellent job there. Um, remind everybody, please, um, Q&As into the uh, feature um, at the bottom right-hand screen of, your, uh, of Zoom. Um, I have one for you, David, and it's been kind of trying to watch the unfolding of the political situation in the Central African Republic, and I know you touched on it briefly, um, but how do you think this is going to unfold, and what's the relationship with the other countries in the region and the impact on, uh, on the flow of arms and corruption and, and how this may impact counterterrorism efforts in the region? I, I think that's a very good question, Adam. Um, what is going on in, in Central Africa? Uh, it's not just Central Africa by name, uh, but it is also in the central of Africa. Uh, and that means it is surrounded by uh, very porous boundaries and very weak borders. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you've got Cameroon, uh, which, you know, provides, um, you know, most of the uh, supplies of... Um, of aid, uh, supplies of um, logistic in terms of food items uh, 
uh, now Cameroon is also uh, experiencing um, terrorism in the northern part, you know, which of course is linked to the Lake Chad Basin uh, with Nigeria, Chad and, and Niger Republic. So the impact of the current um, uh, impasse in, in Central Africa Republic is quite huge. Um, and, and why is this happening? Because of, of the disagreement uh, between the, the government and the Constitutional Court in allowing ex-president Francois Bozizi um, from, you know, running as a member of the KNK, which is, you know, locally referred to as Kwana Kwa. And, you know, uh, Bozizi um, says that uh, the, the, the reason why, um, you know, he's not allowed to run um, is, is because, you know, uh, the Russia is behind you know, the, the government of um, Central Africa Republic, of uh, Faustin Aswant, uh, and that, um, you know, uh, this government is run by mercenaries, um, you know, who are exploiting the country. And, you know, so you've got these, you know, mix of politics within Central Africa Republic itself. Uh, the, the government on one, on one hand saying that Bozizi, you know, is affiliated to the French, um, who are, you know, supporting his forces. Uh, but, but then you also have uh, regional implications, not only from Cameroon, but from Chad, uh, where most of the Central African Republicans believe uh, that Chadians are behind uh, most of the mercenaries uh, on, on ground. So um, remember that Chad is also a member of the, the G5 Sahel uh, and also a member of the multinational joint tax force, which is responsible for um, fighting uh, Boko Haram in, in the northern part of Nigeria, the Lake Chad Basin, uh, but also the, the G5, which is um, uh, backed by France. You know, uh, I'm sure the audience remembers, uh, you know, after Operation Bakane uh, in 2012, uh, the French government introduced uh, the G5 Sahel. And, and now you have the, um, uh, the, uh, the European mission, which is called Operation Takuba. So you've got a direct impact here, Adam, um, between uh, what is going on uh, in Central Africa Republic and the counter-terrorism strategies which have been put in place al along, along those um, countries which border Central Africa Republic. So it is what I refer to as the mix between terrorism and, and criminality, you know, um, if I may use that word. Uh, over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you again, David. Um, Florence uh, Kayemba, I believe you are trying to ask a question or you at least have raised your hand. I just uh, ask you if you could use the Q and A uh, function to the right of raise your hand in um, in in the on the Zoom screen. If if you are trying to ask a question, uh, just let me know. Huh? Yes, she is. It was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> um, first question, second question, David. Thank you uh, for the presentation. How would you explain that some countries like Mauritania, Senegal? Uh, just like Burkina Faso under the regime of Compaore, have not recorded any terrorist attacks? I, I think, um, you know, um, why uh, countries have not recorded um, uh, any terrorist attacks, especially when you talk about Mauritania, Senegal. Um, I, I know um, Burkina Faso has um, uh, recorded some terrorist attacks. Um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the um, Jenim, which is part of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, you know, has launched um, attacks in, in Burkina Faso, uh, which, you know, is situated, you know, between uh, Mali and Niger Republic. Now, I think what is happening uh, with Mauritania and, and Senegal is, um, is, is what a lot of um, researchers have, have said. These countries have been used by these terrorist organizations as sleeper cells, you know, they use it to uh, carry out recruitment, um, but they have no interest in carrying out attacks in these countries because it then blocks uh, the ability to recruit from these countries. It blocks their ability to use these countries as sleeper cells. So uh, I think there is some kind of a, a, a tactical uh, strategy by these jihadist organizations not to launch attacks in all the surrounding countries where they operate. Uh, I mean, the rationale behind that perhaps is if we carry out attack in each and every one of these countries, then we have no areas where we can, you know, um, you know, use as a safe haven. And, and that has been the same explanation that uh, has been put forward of why jihadist groups have not carried out attacks in Ghana. 
So I, I think um, I, I would lean towards uh, a, a much more uh, strategic uh, or tactical move from uh, these organizations rather than a, um, a, a some kind of a, a, a strategy by these countries to um, put up some resilience against them. Thank you. Um, the next question, do you think COVID-19, uh, do you think COVID has an impact on terrorist activity? Uh, do you think that COVID has impacted journalists' ability to report these incidents? Well, as I did mention earlier on, I think um, uh, COVID-19, um, as long as it's had an, an impact on, on, on countries themselves, it's also had a direct impact on the way that um, countries have launched uh, counterterrorism strategies. I mean, take, for example, um, you know, groups like um, Boko Haram, uh, books like Al Qaeda, you know, they've made it very clear that the failure of governments uh, to really put up um, an economic and, and also a, a robust um, system to deal with uh, the impact of COVID-19 has been explained as the weakness of these states. And these organizations um, have used this to recruit uh, people uh, within their camps. Also, um, one of the things that we've seen uh, after COVID-19 is the, um, the proliferation of propaganda materials online. As more people are locked down uh, and, and relying on online communication, uh, jihadist organizations have also uh, branched uh, to this area much more and, and um, impacting on the ideology, uh, passing on their messages in, um, increasing their propaganda, uh, their misinformation, and, and their disinformation. So I think, you know, on the part of um, uh, terrorist activities, we've seen a significant impact on, on that uh, aspect. Now, whether it impacts on the way that journalists uh, report incidents, uh, I think uh, that is also a very critical issue. If you cannot travel to areas because of COVID-19, then of course it will have an impact on on, on the way that uh, reports have been carried out. So but that is a matter of, of a case-by-case -case basis, um, in, in all honesty. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine, for that question. The next question, David, is the, the French are trying to reduce their troops in Mali and have been opposed to negotiations with the jihadist groups. How do you think that they uh, want to reduce their troops? Do you think that the negotiations with jihadists are, are likely to end the violence and resolve the conflict? I think what is going on in Mali is a catch-22. Um, uh, before the, um, uh, the recent uh, overthrow uh, coup d'etat uh, that um, you know, was organized by the military junta, um, uh, which uh, took out ex-president Abubakar Keita, one of the key um, issues there was a disagreement uh, between uh, the French on one side on whether the Malian government should consider a negotiation and a... Um, you know, a, some kind of a push by the local population uh, for talks to, to happen. Um, so I, I think, you know, in my opinion, uh, the, the French uh, will not reduce uh, their troops in Mali, even though they say they will. Um, if you look at uh, Operation Bakane, um, but also added to that, you know, you've got uh, the, the G5 Sahel, which is sponsored by the French and other countries. Uh, you've got Operation Takuba, which is a European Union mission, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, the, the French have got, you know, uh, thousands of, uh, more than 5,000 French troops uh, in the uh, Liptakogoma region, not just in Mali. Uh, some of them are linked very much uh, to uh, Burkina Faso. Um, so I, I don't see the French reducing their forces um, in, in Mali at this point in time. I don't think it benefits France. Uh, but I wish that uh, this could be a consideration um, if the French uh, could empower uh, the Malians uh, to be able to uh, have the capacity to deal with um, uh, these uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS movements uh, within uh, the, their country. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, uh, the presence of the French will give any um, opportunity for any uh, effective negotiations to take place. That would only happen um, if the French are seen to be um, not as influential as they are at this point in time. So I, I would go for uh, a Malian approach. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew Berry, for that. <laughs> thank you for a good answer. Uh, just to remind everybody, we still have time for some uh, q and A. So if you'd like to enter your questions, uh, use the Q&A feature on the bottom right-hand corner of Zoom. The next question is, um, 
uh, it, it was really very interesting. And I, as I say, the last time I was in the Sahel, I, my flight was canceled due to the dust storm. Um, <laughs> so the question here is, can you look forward uh, for a few decades to severe climate changes, change impacts on Central Africa and extrapolate any specifics about the ways this will change extremist dynamics? The rise in temperature will be worse here than globally due to the location near the equator. The DRC can expect five to seven degree increase uh, in Fahrenheit by 2050. Um, so I, the whole issue of climate change, uh, you know, movement, um, lack of uh, raw materials, uh, water, uh, really very interesting uh, concept for this region, which we all know is, is, is struggling. Yes, I, I think you're right, um, Adam and, uh, and Francis. Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, very pertinent question. Uh, one thing which we always say is that, um, uh, you know, these are, I call them water wars, um, Adam. Um, and, and, and what we continuously see, um, especially when we talk about the Sahel region, for example, but also the Lake Chad, because we have uh, the same dynamic um, uh, within the, the, uh, uh, the, the entire Sahel, uh, where uh, climate change has had varying impacts on on um, on, on local communities, um, and and that itself is is driving conflict. Now there is another argument that conflict, you know, um, has a a somewhat direct or indirect impact on, on climate change uh, because when people are uh, are forced to um, you know uh, flee their homes as a result of of conflict, then there is uh, some kind of pressure. On, on communities, um, you know, to ensure that, uh, you know, they, they, they protect, uh, the, you know, the, their territory, you know, to, to use that word. So, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've seen a, a continuous um, clash between uh, communities in, for example, in, in, uh, in, in Mali. Um, we've seen the same clashes uh, ongoing in, in the Niger Republic, in Nigeria, where, you know, um, farmers, you know, or farmer communities would have um, uh, a, a serious um, clash uh, with um, other 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 communities, you know, uh, which are, are, are referred to as, as heather communities. So, um, you know, climate change has, you know, different devastating impact uh, in the way that is is, is affected uh, the uh, you know the the the, the, the security uh, situations in, um, in in the Sahel and and um, areas in in, the, in Central Africa Republic in Central Africa. Um, so it, it's something which um, it's, it's a dynamic which continuously, um, you know, uh, has uh, a, a serious impact because governments don't really have the capacity to solve long term uh, problems. You know, uh, talking about climate change, these are very, um, you know, uh, uh, long term, uh, you know, resource intensive um, uh, programs that, you know, requires, you know, a full governance um, strategy to deal with it and, and not just uh, something that can be resolved by one particular country. So um, I, I think for that reason, uh, the, the, the problem is, is somehow bigger than uh, the, the, the challenge. Uh, and and what I think, uh, you know, should be done, and, and I'm sure that that is what is being done when we talk about the, the global uh, war um, for uh, the, the protection of the environment. I think it has to be um, you know, a, a global initiative and support has to come not just from the countries that are directly impacted, um, but I think from uh, the, the countries that will have the indirect impact uh, should these climate change issues continue to, uh, to occur. So, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, Francis, uh, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a long-term issue. Um, you know, uh, we, we've all seen it uh, as the Lake Chad is shrinking. Um, we've seen the impact of how uh, communities have been moved and how that is, is causing clashes, um, even in the central part of Nigeria. You know, so, um, you know, it's something that extremists have seized the opportunity to, uh, to expose the weaknesses of states, just like they've done with COVID-19. Um, you know, for every uh, failure of the government, uh, the jihadists will use it as an opportunity uh, to win hearts and minds. Um, excellent. Thank you, David. 
um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because um, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, uh, the next question is asking about Mozambique. And I know we talked a little bit about uh, Cabo Delgado yeah. um, earlier, but why Mozambique? Why now? What are the prospects for its spread or containment in the country and in the region? Uh, I think Mozambique has been a special case. Um, but, you know, the question is, why, why Mozambique? Uh, of course, if you look at the, uh, the area where um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the local group called the Mochibabos in the northern part of, uh, um, of Cabo Delgado, especially the district of uh, Mosimbao de Praia, th there is a, a specific location there that is known as the Afungi Peninsula, where you've got a huge investment of, um, I think, about 16 billion or something of that nature in, in terms of investment that has been carried out on, on, on that area to extract gas. I mean, this is one of the, the biggest um, uh, source of gas in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the eastern part of Africa. So Mozambique, is, it, it's, it's not just the, the country, but this very location that uh, these, these groups have decided to locate themselves. Uh, you know, it provides a huge forest, you know, for them to be able to, to escape. Uh, you, you've got a, um, a very much, very closer links, uh, to, you know, uh, through the waters uh, with, uh, um, you know, countries like Tanzania. Um, you know, people can really sneak in and out of this area. You know, they can use kidnapping uh, to disappear into the very huge forest. So I, I think, you know, for the past uh, four years, um, you know, Mozambique has been, uh, you know, taking advantage of, especially the, the, the northern part, um, thanks to um, the, uh, the, the, the use by the, one of the Renamo Jontes, you know, that may have, you know, pointed this area as a very good location uh, to hide and carry out activities. So uh, uh, what, what, what we see in Mozambique is, is an advantage um, that uh, these uh, local groups have taken, uh, they claim uh, that uh, they are fighting for the, um, the disenfranchisement and the uh, underdevelopment of uh, the northern part of Mozambique. But the activities of this group is very much aligned to uh, the ISIS tactics uh, of chopping heads, um, ISIS tactics of kidnapping uh, for ransom, um, holding um, uh, companies that operate in this region uh, to task. Um, so you know, it is a very strategic location, Mozambique, uh, the, the northern part. And, and, and the reason why I think uh, they have selected uh, this location is nothing to do with uh, the ISIS ideology, but, you know, very much to do with resources. Um, just like ISIS, you know, was um, very much placed uh, strategically in, um, in an area in, in Idlib where you've had, um, you know, oil fields, um, just like you have, uh, um, you know, the Taliban and Al Qaeda uh, roaming the, um, the 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 Tora Bora mountains, you know, very much strategic, you know, areas where, um, you know, uh, organized crime trades routes, you know, were so much situated. So these groups are not stupid, um, you know, to say the least. Uh, they they know where to go, um, you know, which um, specific location to select. And how that will, you know, will assist in, in not just their narratives, but how they, they grow their capacity. And, and last but not the least, you know, it provides a very much powerful target uh, for these organizations, you know, to strike. And if those three are present, um, why not? You know, it, it ticks all the boxes of an ideal jihadist organization. And, and I think that's why we have uh, the, the situation in, in Mozambique. Okay, um, thank you, David. To the next question, to what degree have foreign terrorist fighters contributed to the intensity of the insurgency in Central and West Africa? I think, uh, you know, Adam, to a very high degree. Um, now, one of the challenges that has been um, in, in, uh, in the foreign fighter question, you know, I, I think I remember last year I had, you know, I did invite uh, some of the uh, Central African authorities. Uh, we, we had a, um, a conference in, in London, and I talked about the, what African countries need to do, um, you know, as far as foreign fighters are concerned. And the, the key issue that was very much highlighted 
was that um, countries like Nigeria, for example, and Niger Republic, Chad, you know, even Libya, um, had no idea um, how many people had left for the Islamic State. I mean, there were a lot of lots of people that left from Tunisia, um, all these northern African countries uh, from Nigeria, but there were no records. Unlike in the European countries where you had some records of, of the people that had left uh, to engage uh, with ISIS uh, so-called caliphate. So um, once the, the, the caliphate was collapsing, um, you had these ISIS tactics of sending back, um, you know, uh, foreign fighters, you know, to return to their various countries of origin. And, and because uh, most of the Central and West African countries had no data as to who had left, it was, it was very clear that um, midwest by porous boundaries and borders, um, these jihadists could simply walk back and, and join other existing groups like um, Boko Haram in, in Nigeria, uh, the Islamic State of the Greater Sahel in, in, in Mali, um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Uh, now we see uh, the same influence that um, we have in, in, in Mozambique. So um, the bad news is that um, uh, the, the, the Islamic State has collapsed, uh, which for some is a good news. Uh, but, you know, for the African countries that have received a huge number of foreign fighters, but they also lack the capacity uh, to deal with these um, foreign fighters, it's somehow a bad news for them. Now, what should be done is, you know, um, is, is, um, is a question of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that I can't really answer. I know what, you know, you know can be done, but I don't know what um, these governments, you know, are, are doing at the moment to ensure... Um, that these foreign fighters are dealt with. Now, the strategy has always remained uh, the use of kinetic and military strategy. Um, they have not been able to stop foreign fighters from coming in because nobody has the capacity to uh, police their borders. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the worst thing that has happened to, to, to Central and West Africa is the, is the return of these foreign fighters. And, and we've seen the impact now, you know, in very clear terms. Thank you. Um, the next question, now going to another one of my favorite places, the Congo. Um, the Kivu region in Eastern Congo is hosting a number of violent groups, including the Allied Defense Force, the LRA, and various Mai Mai militia groups. Would you consider the violence by these groups targeting civilians or military as terrorist attacks, or are they only criminal or bandit groups? I think, you know, the short answer to this is the Allied Democratic Forces uh, are very much aligned uh, to uh, Uganda and, and all, and, you know, DRC, of course, um, the LRA, same. Um, these are groups that um, have uh, some sort of, you know, uh, I think they fit into both boxes, you know, both, you know, this is where a good example of uh, what I call the terror crime nexus. Um, they, they fit very much into that. Some of their activities are very much aligned to criminal activities, especially um, how they, um, uh, they raise funds, uh, you know, within the region. Um, I know uh, for sure that uh, one of the factions of, uh, of, of the leader, um, uh, uh, you know, Kona, is, um, is, operates uh, within Central Africa Republic where they, um, they, sell, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they sell these very rare species of animals which are found in, in, in the deep forests of Central Africa Republic. Now, that, that is one part of their criminal uh, activity, which is very much aligned uh, to uh, the, the sustenance of, of these organizations. Now, um, the, the use of, of terrorism, of course, you know, comes in in terms of, you know, how they, uh, they launch their attacks when they come across um, um, military or security services, or where uh, there is a disagreement with a specific um, a community, um, perhaps maybe some community that leaks information. So um, these groups are, again, uh, by some ways uh, used uh, by, by um, interested uh, parties or governments within the region uh, to, um, uh, for political uh, pressure. Um, also to, um, you know, for, for, power, um, for power balance. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, it's an open secret that 
um, you know, you know, in order for you to uh, be more powerful than your neighbor, you know, they've got to have, you know, some kind of uh, distraction, you know, if that is uh, being done by groups, you know, that could be paid off, uh, why not? So um, uh, I think, again, uh, you know, uh, DRC is a very, you know, interesting country in terms of uh, the, the dynamics uh, within, within the country of how, uh, you know, criminal networks uh, operate, you know, uh, in, in search of its wealth, uh, buried under the ground. Um, but again, that extends to um, other regional states. Um, so short answer, you know, after a long one, is that, yes, they are criminals, uh, but, you know, they are also uh, part of, you know, my network of terrorists in that region. Um, here's another good question. Uh, in, in Mali and Burkina Faso, uh, JNIM, JNIM and ISIS militants have been clashing, whereas in the Central African Republic, um, they have been uh, forming coalitions, the uh, Coalition of Patriots for Change. Why the fighting in one area and the coalition or alliances in the other? Um, you know, JNIM is, uh, is a lot more um, uh, linked uh, to uh, the Sahel region, um, which is the, uh, it's the coalition of, uh, of Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, Ansadim, um, al Murabitum. Uh, they, they are very much uh, aligned to, uh, to Al-Qaeda. And, and, and of course, you know, they're fighting with ISIS for um, a, a space in, um, in the Sahel. Um, you know, these organizations, you know, have been clashing. But, you know, the, the, the links that they have in, in Central Africa Republic is, um, is quite different. Because um, in Central Africa Republic, we've seen a much more political movement uh, by the coalition of Patriots for Change, which is a CPC on the, um, you know, uh, Francois Bozizi, the ex-president. Now, we do know that um, locals are reporting of links between uh, the coalition of the Patriots uh, for Change in, in Central Africa Republic and, um, uh, you know, what they refer to as missionaries uh, from Chad. Um, but what we don't really know is if those missionaries from Chad are equally um, members of Jenin or members of ISIS militants. So perhaps that is something that one needs to really look into. Remember that the Coalition of Patriots for Change, which is a CPC, has only been around for a couple of months. I think, you know, they, they launched the party in November of 2020 and the elections only took place on the 20. 7th of December uh, 2020 as well. So this is a fairly new uh, crisis, you know, uh, wrapped in all, in all grievances. But in terms of the links uh, and the alliances that uh, Jenim has with the CPC, um, that is yet to be established. But if they do, um, then it will be an interesting uh, network. Uh, thank you, Christine, again for, uh, for that question. Well, David, we've uh, really exhausted our time, so um, I think that's a, uh, uh, been a great presentation. We like to try and keep these, uh, as I said at the outset, crisp, about 20 minutes of presentation and 20, 25 minutes of, uh, of questions, and that's what we've done. Uh, on behalf of the entire group, I'd like to thank you for uh, your interest and the quality of your presentation and for your uh, patience and diligence in asking the questions. Uh, I know it's getting late in Abuja, so uh, we will let you go. I would like to remind everybody uh, who is listening, if you would like to make a presentation in one of the, these uh, in a future session, uh, please let me know either through the chat or through the uh, through email. Um, again, we will end it there, David. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, you. enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you uh, to your uh, very engaging audience. Uh, thanks to the Global Terrorism Trends and uh, Analysis Center for this opportunity. Um, I hope, uh, um, you know, uh, I provided 10% uh, of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, you know, of uh, the expectation at least. Um, uh, you know, I, I look forward to more sessions uh, if that uh, ever does exist. Um, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, it's a huge piece of real estate to cover in 45 <laughs> minutes. We, we know that. So yeah, you, thank did, you. Uh, you did an admiral job. Thank you very much. Thank you.